And I would say that that, that, that is an alternative, for example, that my successor uh, may wish to employ, because on balance, I would rather own uh, an index fund than, than, than carry treasury bills. I would, I would say that if we'd instituted that policy in 2007 or 8, uh, we might have been in a different position in terms of, of our ability to move uh, late in 2008 or 2009. Uh, so it, it has certain it has certain execution problems with hundreds of billions of dollars than it does if you were having a similar policy with a billion or two billion or something of the sort. But it's a perfectly it's a perfectly rational observation and. Certainly, looking back on ten years uh, of a bull market, it 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 really jumps out at you. But I would argue that that uh, that uh, uh, if if you're working smaller numbers, it it would make a lot of sense. And if you're working with large numbers, it's it it might well make sense in the future. So dollar averaging is a good way if you have a lump sum to invest. Um, to make sure you're going to do some kind of, like spread it out over four years, do it every quarter or something like that, five years. And that's a, that's a, a, a conservative idea. I think the more powerful part of dollar, of dollar cost averaging really is, is just every year setting aside money and putting it in. Well, sure it is. And that is that kind of option that I just described is, is not available if you don't have the million dollars. Right. So you're starting off and when stock prices go way up, you're happy. You think, boy, have I been smart here. But you should be sad uh, if stock prices go way down and you're, let's say, six year of investing. Well, all of a sudden, you're getting more shares for each dollar you invest. So it's a, it's a way of eliminating to the maximum extent possible uh, the vagaries of the stock market, which in the short term do things for no explainable reason, except the stupidity or hope and fear and greed of investors, all those emotions that get into the game. So dollar cost averaging, absolutely yes. Under those circumstances, and those circumstances are the circumstances that will apply to probably 95% of all investors. People that have joined me because they think it's a permanent home, to do that simply because somebody waves a big check at me would be like selling one of my children because somebody waved a big check. So I, I won't do that. And I want to tell my partners I won't do it so that they're not disappointed in me. More and more, with certain stocks, we've got that approach. Now, if we were chronically short of funds and all kinds of opportunities coming, we might have a somewhat different approach. But our inclination is not to sell things unless we get really discouraged perhaps with the management or we think the economic characteristics of the business change in a big way. I mean, and that happens. So, but we're not going to sell simply because it looks too high in, in all likelihood. I mean, that, you can't make that 100%, but it's, it's, uh, that's, that's, that's the principle under which we're operating. We're generating right now $5 billion of cash a year at least. So it's $100 million bucks every week. And, uh, you know, just that we've been talking here half an hour and I haven't done a damn thing. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, the, the real question is how do you put it out intelligently? And, and if we were selling things, it'd be just that much more. So there may, there might, there may come a time when that would change. But, but we want to add I have partners, shareholders, partners, who would say, if you can get three times what C's candy's worth, why don't you sell it? And that's why I want to be sure before they come in, they know how I think on that. I mean, they're, they're entitled to know that. We can go down. When I ran Magellan, 13 years, it declined 10% or more, nine times the market. Wow. I had a perfect record. I went down more than 10% every time. Whatever the market went down, I went down more. But over the long term, the upside is more than the downside. So you've got to say to yourself, do I need the money? in the next month? Do I need the money in the next year? Do I have kids going to college? Do I have a wedding coming up? Then you're a bad investor. If you, if you, if you can keep putting money in, you have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 year, you should do well. My name is Ted Friedman. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. You said in the 1996 annual report that most investors will find that the best way to own common stocks is in an index fund that charges minimal fees. Two questions. First, there are a lot of different index funds that hold different baskets of stocks. 
What criteria would you use or recommend to select an appropriate index fund? Yeah, I would say that in terms of the index fund, I would I would just take a very broad index. I, I would I would take the S and P 500 as long as I wasn't putting all my money in at one time. If I were going to put money into a index fund in relatively equal amounts over a 20 or 30 year period, I would pick a, I would I would pick a fund. And I know Vanguard has very low costs. I'm sure there are a whole bunch of others that do. I just haven't looked at the field. But I would be very careful about the costs involved uh, because all they're doing for you is is buying that index. Uh, I think that the people who buy those index funds on on average will get better results than the people that buy funds that have higher costs attached to them because it's just a matter of of, of math. If you have a very high percentage of funds being institutionally managed and a great many institutions charge a lot of money for doing it and others charge a little, they're going to get very similar gross results but different net results. And I recommend to all of you reading John John Bogle's written a couple of books in the last five years, and I, I can't give you the titles, but they're very good books, and anybody investing in funds should read those books uh, before investing, or if you've already invested, you still should read the books, and, and it's all you need to know, uh, really, about fund investing. So I would pick a broad index, but I wouldn't toss a chunk in at any one time. I would do it over a period of time, because the, the very nature of index funds is that you are saying, I think America's business is going to do well over, or reasonably well over a long period of time, but I don't know enough to pick the winners, and I don't know enough to pick the winning times. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't know enough to pick the winning times. Occasionally, I think I know enough to pick a winner, but not very often. And I certainly can't pick winners by going down through the whole list and saying this is a winner and this isn't, and so on. So the important thing to do, if you have an overall feeling that businesses a reasonable place to have your money over a long period of time is to invest over a long period of time and not make any bet implicitly by putting a big chunk in at a given time. As to the cri criteria as to when you should or shouldn't, I don't think there are any great criteria on that. I don't think price earnings ratio you know, determines things. I don't think price book ratios, price sales ratios. I don't think any, there, there's no single metric I can give you or than anyone else can give you, in my view, that will tell you this is a great time to buy stocks or not to buy stocks or anything of the sort. It, it, it just isn't that easy. That's why you go to an index fund, and that's why you buy over a period of time. It isn't that easy. You can't get it by reading a magazine. You can't get it by, you know, watching television. You can't, you'd love to have something that said, you know, I mean, that, that you know, if PEs are 12 or below or some number you buy, and if they're 25 or above, you sell. It is. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's, it's a more complex business than that. It couldn't be that easy when you think about it. Uh, so if you are buying an index fund, you are protecting yourself against the fact that you don't know the answers to those questions, but that you think you can do well over time without knowing the answers to those questions as long as you consciously recognize that, that, that fact. And, um, you know, I would, if you're a young person, and you intend to save a portion of your income over time, I just say just pick out a very broad index, and I would, I would probably use the S&P 500, because I, I think if you start getting beyond that, you start starting to think you should be in small caps this time and large caps that time, or this kind of foreign stock. And as soon as you do that, you know, you're in a game you don't know, you know, you're not equipped to play in, in, in all candor. Uh, that would be my recommendation.